Chapter 6. Marilla makes up her mind. Get there they did, however, in due season. Mrs. Spencer lived in a big yellow house at White Sands Cove, and she came to the door with surprise, and welcome mingled on her benevolent face. Dear, dear, she exclaimed, you're the last folks I was looking for today, but I'm real glad to see you. You'll put your horse in? And how are you, Anne? I'm as well as can be expected, thank you, said in smilelessly. A blight seemed to have descended on her. I suppose we'll stay a little while to rest the mare, said Marilla, but I promised Matthew I'd be home early. The fact is, Mrs. Spencer, there's been a queer mistake somewhere, and I've come over to see where it is. We send word, Matthew and I, for you to bring us a boy from the asylum. We told your brother Robert to tell you we wanted a boy ten or eleven years old. Marilla Cuthbert, you don't say so, said Mrs. Spencer in distress. Why, Robert sent word down by his daughter Nancy and she said you wanted a girl, didn't she Flora Jane? Appealing to her daughter who had come out to the steps. She certainly did, Miss Cuthbert, corroborated Flora Jane earnestly. I'm dreadful sorry, said Mrs. Spencer. It's too bad, but it certainly wasn't my fault, you see, Miss Cuthbert. I did the best I could and I thought I was following your instructions. Nancy is a terrible flighty thing. I've often had to scold her well for her heedlessness. It was our own fault, said Marilla resignedly. We should have come to you ourselves and not left an important message to be passed along by word of mouth in that fashion. Anyhow, the mistake has been made and the only thing to do is to set it right. Can we send the child back to the asylum? I suppose they'll take her back, won't they? I suppose so, said Mrs. Spencer thoughtfully, but I don't think it will be necessary to send her back. Mrs. Peter Blue it was up here yesterday, and she was saying to me how much she wished she'd sent by me for a little girl to help her. Mrs. Peter has a large family, you know, and she finds it hard to get help. And will be the very girl for you. I call it positively providential. Marilla did not look as if she thought providence had much to do with the matter. Here was an unexpectedly good chance to get this unwelcome orphan off her hands, and she did not even feel grateful for it. She knew Mrs. Peter blew it only by sight as a small, shrewish-faced woman without an ounce of superfluous flesh on her bones. But she had heard of her. A terrible worker and driver, Mrs. Peter was said to be, and discharged servant girls told fearsome tales of her temper and stinginess, and her family of pert, quarrelsome children. Marilla felt a qualm of conscience at the thought of handing it over to her tender mercies. Well, I'll go in and we'll talk the matter over, she said. And if there isn't Mrs. Peter coming up the lane this blessed minute, exclaimed Mrs. Spencer, bustling her guests through the hall into the parlor, where a deadly chill struck on them as if the air had been strained so long through dark green, closely drawn blinds that it had lost every particle of warmth it had ever possessed. That is real lucky, for we can settle the matter right away. Take the armchair, Miss Cuthbert. And, you sit here on the ottoman and don't wiggle. Let me take your hats. Flora Jane, go out and put the kettle on. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blewett. We were just saying how fortunate it was you happened along. Let me introduce you two ladies. Mrs. Blewett, Miss Cuthbert. Please excuse me for just a moment. I forgot to tell Flora Jane to take the buns out of the oven. Mrs. Spencer whisked away, after pulling up the blinds. And sitting mutely on the ottoman, with her hands clasped tightly in her lap, stared at Mrs. Blewett as one fascinated. Was she to be given into the keeping of this sharp-faced, sharp-eyed woman? She felt a lump coming up in her throat and her eyes smarted painfully. She was beginning to be afraid she couldn't keep the tears back when Mrs. Spencer returned, flushed and beaming, quite capable of taking any and every difficulty, physical, mental or spiritual, into consideration and settling it out of hand. It seems there's been a mistake about this little girl, Mrs. Blewett, she said. I was under the impression that Mr. and Miss Cuthbert wanted a little girl to adopt. I was certainly told so. But it seems it was a boy they wanted. So if you're still of the same mind you were yesterday, I think she'll be just the thing for you. Mrs. Blewett darted her eyes over Anne from head to foot. How old are you and what's your name? She demanded. And surely, faltered the shrinking child, not daring to make any stipulations regarding the spelling thereof, and I'm eleven years old. Humphrey. You don't look as if there was much to you. But you're wiry. I don't know but the wiry ones are the best after all. Well, if I take you you'll have to be a good girl, you know, good and smart and respectful. I'll expect you to earn your keep, and no mistake about that. Yes, I suppose I might as well take her off your hands, Miss Cuthbert. The baby's awful fractious, and I'm clean worn out attending to him. If you like I can take her right home now. Marilla looked at Anne and softened at sight of the child's pale face with its look of mute misery, 
the misery of a helpless little creature who finds itself once more caught in the trap from which it had escaped. Marilla felt an uncomfortable conviction that, if she denied the appeal of that look, it would haunt her to her dying day. Moreover, she did not fancy Mrs. Blewett. To hand a sensitive, high-strung child over to such a woman. No, she could not take the responsibility of doing that. Well, I don't know, she said slowly. I didn't say that Matthew and I had absolutely decided that we wouldn't keep her. In fact I may say that Matthew is disposed to keep her. I just came over to find out how the mistake had occurred. I think I'd better take her home again and talk it over with Matthew. I feel that I oughtn't to decide on anything without consulting him. If we make up our mind not to keep her we'll bring or send her over to you tomorrow night. If we don't you may know that she is going to stay with us. Will that suit you, Mrs. Blewett? I suppose it'll have to, said Mrs. Blewett ungraciously. During Marilla's speech a sunrise had been dawning on Anne's face. First the look of despair faded out, then came a faint flush of hope, her eyes grew deep and bright as morning stars. The child was quite transfigured, and, a moment later, when Mrs. Spencer and Mrs. Blewett went out in quest of a recipe the latter had come to borrow she sprang up and flew across the room to Marilla. Oh Miss Cuthbert, did you really say that perhaps you would let me stay at Green Gables? She said, in a breathless whisper, as if speaking aloud might shatter the glorious possibility. Did you really say it? Or did I only imagine that you did? I think you'd better learn to control that imagination of yours, and, if you can't distinguish between what is real and what isn't, said Marilla crossly. Yes, you did hear me say just that and no more. It isn't decided yet and perhaps we will conclude to let Mrs. Blewett take you after all. She certainly needs you much more than I do. I'd rather go back to the asylum than go to live with her, said in passionately. She looks exactly like a, like a gimlet. Marilla smothered a smile under the conviction that Anne must be reproved for such a speech. A little girl like you should be ashamed of talking so about a lady and a stranger, she said severely. Go back and sit down quietly and hold your tongue and behave as a good girl should. I'll try to do and be anything you want me, if you'll only keep me, said Anne, returning meekly to her ottoman. When they arrived back at Green Gables that evening Matthew met them in the lane. Marilla from afar had noted him prowling along it and guessed his motive. She was prepared for the relief she read in his face when he saw that she had at least brought back and back with her. But she said nothing, to him, relative to the affair, until they were both out in the yard behind the barn milking the cows. Then she briefly told him Anne's history and the result of the interview with Mrs. Spencer. I wouldn't give a dog I like to that bluet woman, said Matthew with unusual vim. I don't fancy her style myself, admitted Marilla, but it's that or keeping her ourselves, Matthew. And since you seem to want her, I suppose I'm willing, or have to be. I've been thinking over the idea until I've got kind of used to it. It seems a sort of duty. I've never brought up a child, especially a girl, and I dare say I'll make a terrible mess of it. But I'll do my best. So far as I'm concerned, Matthew, she may stay. Matthew's shy face was a glow of delight. Well now, I reckon you'd come to see it in that light, Marilla, he said. She's such an interesting little thing. It'd be more to the point if you could say she was a useful little thing, retorted Marilla, but I'll make it my business to see she's trained to be that. And mind, Matthew, you're not to go interfering with my methods. Perhaps an old maid doesn't know much about bringing up a child, but I guess she knows more than an old bachelor. So you just leave me to manage her. When I fail it'll be time enough to put your oar in. There, there, Marilla, you can have your own way, said Matthew reassuringly. Only be as good and kind to her as you can without spoiling her. I kind of think she's one of the sort you can do anything with if you only get her to love you. Marilla sniffed, to express her contempt for Matthew's opinions concerning anything feminine, and walked off to the dairy with the pails. I won't tell her tonight that she can stay, she reflected, as she strained the milk into the creamers. She'd be so excited that she wouldn't sleep a wink. Marilla Cuthbert, you're fairly in for it. Did you ever suppose you'd see the day when you'd be adopting an orphan girl? It's surprising enough, but not so surprising as that Matthew should be at the bottom of it, him that always seemed to have such a mortal dread of little girls. Anyhow, we've decided on the experiment and goodness only knows what will come of it. Dash. Chapter 7. And says her prayers. When Marilla took Anne up to bed that night she said stiffly. Now, Anne, I noticed last night that you threw your clothes all about the floor when you took them off. That is a very untidy habit, and I can't allow it at all. As soon as you take off any article of clothing fold it neatly and place it on the chair. I haven't any use at all for little girls who aren't neat. I was so harrowed up in my mind last night that I didn't think about my clothes at all, said Anne. I'll fold them nicely tonight. They always made us do that at the asylum. 
Half the time, though, I'd forget, I'd be in such a hurry to get into bed nice and quiet and imagine things. You'll have to remember a little better if you stay here, admonished Marilla. There, that looks something like. Say your prayers now and get into bed. I never say any prayers, announced Anne. Marilla looked horrified astonishment. Why, Anne, what do you mean? Were you never taught to say your prayers? God always wants little girls to say their prayers. Don't you know who God is, Anne? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal and unchangeable, in His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, responded Anne promptly and glibly. Marilla looked rather relieved. So you do know something then, thank goodness. You're not quite a heathen. Where did you learn that? Oh, at the Asylum Sunday School. They made us learn the whole catechism. I liked it pretty well. There's something splendid about some of the words. Infinite, eternal and unchangeable. Isn't that grand? It has such a role to it, just like a big organ playing. You couldn't quite call it poetry, I suppose, but it sounds a lot like it, doesn't it? We're not talking about poetry, and we are talking about saying your prayers. Don't you know it's a terrible wicked thing not to say your prayers every night? I'm afraid you are a very bad little girl. You'd find it easier to be bad than good if you had red hair, said in reproachfully. People who haven't red hair don't know what trouble is. Mrs. Thomas told me that God made my hair red on purpose, and I've never cared about him since. And anyhow I'd always be too tired at night to bother saying prayers. People who have to look after twins can't be expected to say their prayers. Now, do you honestly think they can? Marilla decided that Anne's religious training must be begun at once. Plainly there was no time to be lost. You must say your prayers while you are under my roof, Anne. Why, of course, if you want me to, assented Anne cheerfully. I'd do anything to oblige you. But you'll have to tell me what to say for this once. After I get into bed I'll imagine out a real nice prayer to say always. I believe that it will be quite interesting, now that I come to think of it. You must kneel down, said Marilla in embarrassment. And knelt at Marilla's knee and looked up gravely. Why must people kneel down to pray? If I really wanted to pray I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd go out into a great big field all alone or into the deep, deep, woods, and I'd look up into the sky, up, 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 into that lovely blue sky that looks as if there was no end to its blueness. And then I'd just feel a prayer. Well, I'm ready. What am I to say? Marilla felt more embarrassed than ever. She had intended to teach in the childish classic, now I lay me down to sleep. But she had, as I have told you, the glimmerings of a sense of humor, which is simply another name for a sense of fitness of things, and it suddenly occurred to her that that simple little prayer, sacred to white-robed childhood lisping at motherly knees, was entirely unsuited to this freckled witch of a girl who knew and cared nothing about God's love, since she had never had it translated to her through the medium of human love. You're old enough to pray for yourself, and, she said finally. Just thank God for your blessings and ask Him humbly for the things you want. Well, I'll do my best, promised Anne, burying her face in Marilla's lap. Gracious Heavenly Father, that's the way the ministers say it in church, so I suppose it's all right in private prayer, isn't it? She interjected, lifting her head for a moment. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank Thee for the white way of delight and the lake of shining waters and Bonnie and the Snow Queen. I'm really extremely grateful for them. And that's all the blessings I can think of just now to thank Thee for. As for the things I want, they're so numerous that it would take a great deal of time to name them all so I will only mention the two most important. Please let me stay at Green Gables, and please let me be good-looking when I grow up. I remain, yours respectfully, and surely. There, did I do all right? She asked eagerly, getting up. I could have made it much more flowery if I'd had a little more time to think it over. Poor Marilla was only preserved from complete collapse by remembering that it was not irreverence, but simply spiritual ignorance on the part of Anne that was responsible for this extraordinary petition. She tucked the child up in bed, mentally vowing that she should be taught a prayer the very next day, and was leaving the room with the light when Anne called her back. I've just thought of it now. I should have said, Amen in place of yours respectfully, shouldn't I? The way the ministers do. I'd forgotten it, but I felt a prayer should be finished off in some way, so I put in the other. Do you suppose it will make any difference? I, I don't suppose it will said Marilla. Go to sleep now like a good child. Good night. I can only say good night tonight with a clear conscience, said Anne, cuddling luxuriously down among her pillows. Marilla retreated to the kitchen, set the candle firmly on the table, and glared at Matthew. Matthew Cuthbert, it's about time somebody adopted that child and taught her something. She's next door to a perfect heathen. 
Will you believe that she never said a prayer in her life till tonight? I'll send her to the manse tomorrow and borrow the peep of the day series, that's what I'll do. And she shall go to Sunday school just as soon as I can get some suitable clothes made for her. I foresee that I shall have my hands full. Well, well, we can't get through this world without our share of trouble. I've had a pretty easy life of it so far, but my time has come at last and I suppose I'll just have to make the best of it. Dash. Chapter 8. Anne's bringing up is begun. For reasons best known to herself, Marilla did not tell Anne that she was to stay at Green Gables until the next afternoon. During the forenoon she kept the child busy with various tasks and watched over her with a keen eye while she did them. By noon she had concluded that Anne was smart and obedient, willing to work and quick to learn, her most serious shortcoming seemed to be a tendency to fall into daydreams in the middle of a task and forget all about it until such time as she was sharply recalled to earth by a reprimand or a catastrophe. When Anne had finished washing the dinner dishes she suddenly confronted Marilla with the air and expression of one desperately determined to learn the worst. Her thin little body trembled from head to foot, her face flushed and her eyes dilated until they were almost black, she clasped her hands tightly and said in an imploring voice. Oh, please, Miss Cuthbert, won't you tell me if you are going to send me away or not? I've tried to be patient all the morning, but I really feel that I cannot bear not knowing any longer. It's a dreadful feeling. Please tell me. You haven't scalded the dishcloth in clean hot water as I told you to do, said Marilla immovably. Just go and do it before you ask any more questions, Anne. And went and attended to the dishcloth. Then she returned to Marilla and fastened imploring eyes of the latter's face. Well, said Marilla, unable to find any excuse for deferring her explanation longer, I suppose I might as well tell you. Matthew and I have decided to keep you, that is, if you will try to be a good little girl and show yourself grateful. Why, child, whatever is the matter? I'm crying, said Anne in a tone of bewilderment. I can't think why. I'm glad as glad can be. Oh, glad doesn't seem the right word at all. I was glad about the white way and the cherry blossoms, but this. Oh, it's something more than glad. I'm so happy. I'll try to be so good. It will be uphill work, I expect, for Mrs. Thomas often told me I was desperately wicked. However, I'll do my very best. But can you tell me why I'm crying? I suppose it's because you're all excited and worked up, said Marilla disapprovingly. Sit down on that chair and try to calm yourself. I'm afraid you both cry and laugh far too easily. Yes, you can stay here and we will try to do right by you. You must go to school, but it's only a fortnight till vacation so it isn't worthwhile for you to start before it opens again in September. What am I to call you? Asked Anne. Shall I always say Miss Cuthbert? Can I call you Aunt Marilla? No, you'll call me just plain Marilla. I'm not used to being called Miss Cuthbert and it would make me nervous. It sounds awfully disrespectful to just say Marilla, protested Anne. I guess there'll be nothing disrespectful in it if you're careful to speak respectfully. Everybody, young and old, in Avonlea calls me Marilla except the minister. He says Miss Cuthbert, when he thinks of it. I'd love to call you Aunt Marilla, said Anne wistfully. I've never had an aunt or any relation at all, not even a grandmother. It would make me feel as if I really belonged to you. Can I call you Aunt Marilla? No. I'm not your aunt and I don't believe in calling people names that don't belong to them. But we could imagine you were my aunt. I couldn't, said Marilla grimly. Do you never imagine things different from what they really are? Asked Anne wide-eyed. No. Oh. And drew a long breath. Oh, Miss, Marilla, how much you miss. I don't believe in imagining things different from what they really are, retorted Marilla. When the Lord puts us in certain circumstances he doesn't mean for us to imagine them away. And that reminds me. Go into the sitting room, and, be sure your feet are clean and don't let any flies in, and bring me out the illustrated card that's on the mantelpiece. The Lord's Prayer is on it and you'll devote your spare time this afternoon to learning it off by heart. There's to be no more of such praying as I heard last night. I suppose I was very awkward, said and apologetically, but then, you see, I'd never had any practice. You couldn't really expect a person to pray very well the first time she tried, could you? I thought out a splendid prayer after I went to bed, just as I promised you I would. It was nearly as long as a minister's and so poetical. But would you believe it? I couldn't remember one word when I woke up this morning. And I'm afraid I'll never be able to think out another one as good. Somehow, things never are so good when they're thought out a second time. Have you ever noticed that? Here is something for you to notice, and... When I tell you to do a thing I want you to obey me at once and not stand stock still and discourse about it. Just you go and do as I bid you. 
and promptly departed for the sitting room across the hall. She failed to return. After waiting ten minutes Marilla laid down her knitting and marched after her with a grim expression. She found and standing motionless before a picture hanging on the wall between the two windows, with her eyes a star with dreams. The white and green light strained through apple trees and clustering vines outside fell over the rapt little figure with a half-unearthly radiance. Anne, whatever are you thinking of? demanded Marilla sharply. And came back to earth with a start. That, she said, pointing to the picture, a rather vivid chromo entitled, Christ blessing little children, and I was just imagining I was one of them, that I was the little girl in the blue dress, standing off by herself in the corner as if she didn't belong to anybody, like me. She looks lonely and sad, don't you think? I guess she hadn't any father or mother of her own. But she wanted to be blessed, too, so she just crept shyly up on the outside of the crowd, hoping nobody would notice her, except him. I'm sure I know just how she felt. Her heart must have beat and her hands must have got cold, like mine did when I asked you if I could stay. She was afraid he mightn't notice her. But it's likely he did, don't you think? I've been trying to imagine it all out, her edging a little nearer all the time until she was quite close to him, and then he would look at her and put his hand on her hair and oh, such a thrill of joy as would run over her. But I wish the artist hadn't painted him so sorrowful looking. All his pictures are like that, if you've noticed. But I don't believe he could really have looked so sad or the children would have been afraid of him. And, said Marilla, wondering why she had not broken into this speech long before, you shouldn't talk that way. It's irreverent, positively irreverent. Anne's eyes marveled. Why, I felt just as reverent as could be. I'm sure I didn't mean to be irreverent. Well I don't suppose you did, but it doesn't sound right to talk so familiarly about such things. And another thing, Anne, when I send you after something you're to bring it at once and not fall into mooning and imagining before pictures. Remember that. Take that card and come right to the kitchen. Now, sit down in the corner and learn that prayer off by heart. And set the card up against the jug full of apple blossoms she had brought in to decorate the dinner table. Marilla had had that decoration askance, but had said nothing, propped her chin on her hands, and fell to studying it intently for several silent minutes. I like this, she announced at length. It's beautiful. I've heard it before, I heard the superintendent of the asylum Sunday school say it over once. But I didn't like it then. He had such a cracked voice and he prayed it so mournfully. I really felt sure he thought praying was a disagreeable duty. This isn't poetry, but it makes me feel just the same way poetry does. Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name. That is just like a line of music. Oh, I'm so glad you thought of making me learn this, Miss Marilla. Well, learn it and hold your tongue, said Marilla shortly. And tip the vase of apple blossoms near enough to bestow a soft kiss on a pink cupped bud, and then study diligently for some moments longer. Marilla, she demanded presently, do you think that I shall ever have a bosom friend in Avonlea? A, a what kind of friend? A bosom friend, an intimate friend, you know, a really kindred spirit to whom I can confide my inmost soul. I've dreamed of meeting her all my life. I never really supposed I would, but so many of my loveliest dreams have come true all at once that perhaps this one will, too. Do you think it's possible? Diana Berry lives over at Orchard Slope and she's about your age. She's a very nice little girl, and perhaps she will be a playmate for you when she comes home. She's visiting her aunt over at Carmody just now. You'll have to be careful how you behave yourself, though. Mrs. Barry is a very particular woman. She won't let Diana play with any little girl who isn't nice and good. Anne looked at Marilla through the apple blossoms, her eyes aglow with interest. What is Diana like? Her hair isn't red, is it? Oh, I hope not. It's bad enough to have red hair myself, but I positively couldn't endure it in a bosom friend. Diana is a very pretty little girl. She has black eyes and hair and rosy cheeks. And she is good and smart, which is better than being pretty. Marilla was as fond of morals as the Duchess in Wonderland, and was firmly convinced that one should be tacked onto every remark made to a child who was being brought up. But Anne waved the moral inconsequently aside and seized only on the delightful possibilities before it. Oh, I'm so glad she's pretty. Next to being beautiful oneself, and that's impossible in my case, it would be best to have a beautiful bosom friend. When I lived with Mrs. Thomas she had a bookcase in her sitting room with glass doors. There weren't any books in it, Mrs. Thomas kept her best china and her preserves there, when she had any preserves to keep. One of the doors was broken. Mr. Thomas smashed it one night when he was slightly intoxicated. But the other was whole and I used to pretend that my reflection in it was another little girl who lived in it. I called her Katie Maurice, and we were very intimate. I used to talk to her by the hour, 
especially on Sunday, and tell her everything. Katie was the comfort and consolation of my life. We used to pretend that the bookcase was enchanted and that if I only knew the spell I could open the door and step right into the room where Katie Maurice lived, instead of into Mrs. Thomas' shelves of preserves in China. And then Katie Maurice would have taken me by the hand and led me out into a wonderful place, all flowers and sunshine and fairies, and we would have lived there happy forever after. When I went to live with Mrs. Hammond it just broke my heart to leave Katie Maurice. She felt it dreadfully too, I know she did, for she was crying when she kissed me goodbye through the bookcase door. There was no bookcase at Mrs. Hammond's. But just up the river a little way from the house there was a long green little valley, and the loveliest echo lived there. It echoed back every word you said, even if you didn't talk a bit loud. So I imagined that it was a little girl called Violetta and we were great friends and I loved her almost as well as I loved Katie Maurice, not quite, but almost, you know. The night before I went to the asylum I said goodbye to Violetta, and oh, her goodbye came back to me in such sad, sad tones. I had become so attached to her that I hadn't the heart to imagine a bosom friend at the asylum, even if there had been any scope for imagination there. I think it's just as well there wasn't, said Marilla dryly. I don't approve of such goings on. You seem to half believe your own imaginations. It will be well for you to have a real live friend to put such nonsense out of your head. But don't let Mrs. Barry hear you talking about your Katie Maurice's and your Violetta's or she'll think you tell stories. Oh, I won't. I couldn't talk of them to everybody, their memories are too sacred for that. But I thought I'd like to have you know about them. Oh, look, here's a big bee just tumbled out of an apple blossom. Just think what a lovely place to live, in an apple blossom. Fancy going to sleep in it when the wind was rocking it. If I wasn't a human girl I think I'd like to be a bee and live among the flowers. Yesterday you wanted to be a seagull, sniffed Marilla. I think you are very fickle-minded. I told you to learn that prayer and not talk. But it seems impossible for you to stop talking if you've got anybody that will listen to you. So go up to your room and learn it. Oh, I know it pretty nearly all now, all but just the last line. Well, never mind, do as I tell you. Go to your room and, and finish learning it well, and stay there until I call you down to help me get tea. Can I take the apple blossoms with me for company? Pleaded Anne. No, you don't want your room cluttered up with flowers. You should have left them on the tree in the first place. I did feel a little that way, too, said Anne. I kind of felt I shouldn't shorten their lovely lives by picking them, I wouldn't want to be picked if I were an apple blossom. But the temptation was irresistible. What do you do when you meet with an irresistible temptation? And did you hear me tell you to go to your room? And sighed, retreated to the east gable, and sat down in a chair by the window. There, I know this prayer. I learned that last sentence coming upstairs. Now I'm going to imagine things into this room so that they'll always stay imagined. The floor is covered with a white velvet carpet with pink roses all over it and there are pink silk curtains at the windows. The walls are hung with gold and silver brocade tapestry. The furniture is mahogany. I never saw any mahogany but it does sound so luxurious. This is a couch all heaped with gorgeous silken cushions, pink and blue and crimson and gold, and I am reclining gracefully on it. I can see my reflection in that splendid big mirror hanging on the wall. I am tall and regal, clad in a gown of trailing white lace, with a pearl cross on my breast and pearls in my hair. My hair is of midnight darkness and my skin is clear ivory pallor. My name is the Lady Cordelia Fitzgerald. No, it isn't, I can't make that seem real. She danced up to the little looking glass and peered into it. Her pointed freckled face and solemn gray eyes peered back at her. You're only Anne of Green Gables, she said earnestly, and I see you, just as you are looking now, whenever I try to imagine I'm the Lady Cordelia. But it's a million times nicer to be Anne of Green Gables than Anne of Nowhere in particular, isn't it? She bent forward, kissed her reflection affectionately, and betook herself to the open window. Dear Snow Queen, good afternoon. And good afternoon dear birches down in the hollow. And good afternoon dear grey house up on the hill. I wonder if Diana is to be my bosom friend. I hope she will, and I shall love her very much. But I must never quite forget Katie Maurice and Violetta. They would feel so hurt if I did and I'd hate to hurt anybody's feelings, even a little bookcase girls or a little echo girls. I must be careful to remember them and send them a kiss every day. And blew a couple of airy kisses from her fingertips past the cherry blossoms and then, with her chin in her hands, drifted luxuriously out on a sea of daydreams. Dash. Chapter 9. Mrs. Rachel Lynde is properly horrified. And had been a fortnight at Green Gables before Mrs. Lynde arrived to inspect her. Mrs. Rachel, to do her justice, was not to blame for this. 
a severe and unseasonable attack of grip had confined the good lady to her house ever since the occasion of her last visit to Green Gables. Mrs. Rachel was not often sick, and had a well-defined contempt for people who were, but grip, she asserted, was like no other illness on earth and could only be interpreted as one of the special visitations of Providence. As soon as her doctor allowed her to put her foot out of doors she hurried up to Green Gables, bursting with curiosity to see Matthew and Marilla's orphan, concerning whom all sorts of stories and suppositions had gone abroad in Avonlea. And had made good use of every waking moment of that fortnight. Already she was acquainted with every tree and shrub about the place. She had discovered that a lane opened out below the apple orchard and ran up through a belt of woodland, and she had explored it to its furthest end in all its delicious vagaries of brook and bridge, fir coppice and wild cherry arch, corners thick with fern, and branching byways of maple and mountain ash. She had made friends with the spring down in the hollow, that wonderful deep, clear icy cold spring, it was set about with smooth red sandstones and rimmed in by great palm like clumps of water fern, and beyond it was a log bridge over the brook. That bridge led Anne's dancing feet up over a wooded hill beyond, where perpetual twilight reigned under the straight, thick-growing firs and spruces, the only flowers there were myriads of delicate June bells, those shyest and sweetest of woodland blooms, and a few pale, aerial starflowers, like the spirits of last year's blossoms. Gossamers glimmered like threads of silver among the trees, and the fir boughs and tassels seemed to utter friendly speech. All these raptured voyages of exploration were made in the odd half-hours which she was allowed for play, and then talked Matthew and Marilla half-deaf over her discoveries. Not that Matthew complained, to be sure, he listened to it all with a wordless smile of enjoyment on his face, Marilla permitted the chatter until she found herself becoming too interested in it, whereupon she always promptly quenched Anne by a curt command to hold her tongue and was out in the orchard when Mrs. Rachel came, wandering at her own sweet will through the lush, tremulous grasses splashed with ruddy evening sunshine, so that good lady had an excellent chance to talk her illness fully over, describing every ache and pulse beat with such evident enjoyment that Marilla thought even grip must bring its compensations. When details were exhausted Mrs. Rachel introduced the real reason of her call. I've been hearing some surprising things about you and Matthew. I don't suppose you are any more surprised than I am myself, said Marilla. I'm getting over my surprise now. It was too bad there was such a mistake, said Mrs. Rachel sympathetically. Couldn't you have sent her back? I suppose we could, but we decided not to. Matthew took a fancy to her. And I must say I like her myself, although I admit she has her faults. The house seems a different place already. She's a real bright little thing. Marilla said more than she had intended to say when she began, for she read disapproval in Mrs. Rachel's expression. It's a great responsibility you've taken on yourself, said that lady gloomily, especially when you've never had any experience with children. You don't know much about her or her real disposition, I suppose, and there's no guessing how a child like that will turn out. But I don't want to discourage you I'm sure, Marilla. I'm not feeling discouraged, was Marilla's dry response, when I make up my mind to do a thing it stays made up. I suppose you'd like to see Anne. I'll call her in. And came running in presently her face sparkling with the delight of her orchard rovings, but, abashed at finding the delight herself in the unexpected presence of a stranger, she halted confusedly inside the door. She certainly was an odd-looking little creature in the short tight wincy dress she had worn from the asylum, below which her thin legs seemed ungracefully long. Her freckles were more numerous and obtrusive than ever, the wind had ruffled her hatless hair into over-brilliant disorder, it had never looked redder than at that moment. Well, they didn't pick you for your looks, that's sure and certain, was Mrs. Rachel Lynn's emphatic comment. Mrs. Rachel was one of those delightful and popular people who pride themselves on speaking their mind without fear or favor. She's terrible skinny and homely, Marilla. Come here, child, and let me have a look at you. Lawful heart, did anyone ever see such freckles? And hair as red as carrots. Come here, child, I say. And came there, but not exactly as Mrs. Rachel expected. With one bound she crossed the kitchen floor and stood before Mrs. Rachel, her face scarlet with anger, her lips quivering, and her whole slender form trembling from head to foot. I hate you, she cried in a choked voice, stamping her foot on the floor. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, a louder stamp with each assertion of hatred. How dare you call me skinny and ugly? How dare you say I'm freckled and red-headed? You are a rude, impolite, unfeeling woman. Anne, exclaimed Marilla in consternation but Anne continued to face Mrs. Rachel undauntedly, head up, eyes blazing, hands clenched, passionate indignation exhaling from her like an atmosphere. How dare you say such things about me? She repeated vehemently. How would you like to have such things said about you? 
How would you like to be told that you are fat and clumsy and probably hadn't a spark of imagination in you? I don't care if I do hurt your feelings by saying so. I hope I hurt them. You have hurt mine worse than they were ever hurt before even by Mrs. Thomas' intoxicated husband. And I'll never forgive you for it, never, never. Stamp. Stamp. Did anybody ever see such a temper, exclaimed the horrified Mrs. Rachel. And go to your room and stay there until I come up, said Marilla, recovering her powers of speech with difficulty. Anne, bursting into tears, rushed to the hall door, slammed it until the tins on the porch wall outside rattled in sympathy, and fled through the hall and up the stairs like a whirlwind. A subdued slam above told that the door of the east gable had been shut with equal vehemence. Well, I don't envy you your job bringing that up, Marilla, said Mrs. Rachel with unspeakable solemnity. Marilla opened her lips to say she knew not what of apology or deprecation. What she did say was a surprise to herself then and ever afterwards. You shouldn't have twitted her about her looks, Rachel. Marilla Cuthbert, you don't mean to say that you are upholding her in such a terrible display of temper as we've just seen? demanded Mrs. Rachel indignantly. No, said Marilla slowly, I'm not trying to excuse her. She's been very naughty and I'll have to give her a talking to about it. But we must make allowances for her. She's never been taught what is right. And you were too hard on her, Rachel. Marilla could not help tacking on that last sentence, although she was again surprised at herself for doing it. Mrs. Rachel got up with an air of offended dignity. Well, I see that I'll have to be very careful what I say after this, Marilla, since the fine feelings of orphans, brought from goodness knows where, have to be considered before anything else. Oh, no, I'm not vexed, don't worry yourself. I'm too sorry for you to leave any room for anger in my mind you'll have your own troubles with that child. But if you'll take my advice, which I suppose you won't do, although I've brought up ten children and buried two, you'll do that talking to you mentioned with a fair-sized birch switch. I should think that would be the most effective language for that kind of a child. Her temper matches her hair I guess. Well, good evening, Marilla. I hope you'll come down to see me often as usual. But you can't expect me to visit here again in a hurry, if I'm liable to be flown and insulted in such a fashion. It's something new in my experience. Whereat Mrs. Rachel swept out in a way, if a fat woman who always waddled could be said to sweep away, and Marilla with a very solemn face betook herself to the east gable. On the way upstairs she pondered uneasily as to what she ought to do. She felt no little dismay over the scene that had just been enacted. How unfortunate that Anne should have displayed such temper before Mrs. Rachel Lynde, of all people. Then Marilla suddenly became aware of an uncomfortable and rebuking consciousness that she felt more humiliation over this than sorrow over the discovery of such a serious defect in Anne's disposition. And how was she to punish her? The amiable suggestion of the birch switch, to the efficiency of which all of Mrs. Rachel's own children could have borne smarting testimony, did not appeal to Marilla. She did not believe she could whip a child. No, some other method of punishment must be found to bring Anne to a proper realization of the enormity of her offense. Marilla found Anne face downward on her bed, crying bitterly, quite oblivious of muddy boots on a clean counterpane. And, she said not ungently. No answer. And, with greater severity, get off that bed this minute and listen to what I have to say to you. And squirmed off the bed and sat rigidly on a chair beside it, her face swollen and tear-stained and her eyes fixed stubbornly on the floor. This is a nice way for you to behave. And, aren't you ashamed of yourself? She hadn't any right to call me ugly and red-headed, retorted Anne, evasive and defiant. You hadn't any right to fly into such a fury and talk the way you did to her, Anne. I was ashamed of you, thoroughly ashamed of you. I wanted you to behave nicely to Mrs. Lynde, and instead of that you have disgraced me. I'm sure I don't know why you should lose your temper like that just because Mrs. Lynde said you were red-haired and homely. You say it yourself often enough. Oh, but there's such a difference between saying a thing yourself and hearing other people say it, wailed Anne. You may know a thing is so, but you can't help hoping other people don't quite think it is. I suppose you think I have an awful temper, but I couldn't help it. When she said those things something just rose right up in me and choked me. I had to fly out at her. Well, you made a fine exhibition of yourself I must say. Mrs. Lynde will have a nice story to tell about you everywhere, and she'll tell it, too. It was a dreadful thing for you to lose your temper like that, and Just imagine how you would feel if somebody told you to your face that you were skinny and ugly, pleaded and tearfully. An old remembrance suddenly rose up before Marilla. She had been a very small child when she had heard one aunt say of her to another, what a pity she is such a dark, homely little thing. Marilla was every day of fifty before the sting had gone out of that memory. 
I don't say that I think Mrs. Lynde was exactly right in saying what she did to you, and, she admitted in a softer tone. Rachel is too outspoken. But that is no excuse for such behavior on your part. She was a stranger and an elderly person and my visitor, all three very good reasons why you should have been respectful to her. You were rude and saucy and Marilla had a saving inspiration of punishment, you must go to her and tell her you are very sorry for your bad temper and ask her to forgive you. I can never do that, said indeterminately and darkly. You can punish me in any way you like, Marilla. You can shut me up in a dark, damp dungeon inhabited by snakes and toads and feed me only on bread and water and I shall not complain. But I cannot ask Mrs. Lynn to forgive me. We're not in the habit of shutting people up in dark damp dungeons, said Marilla dryly, especially as they're rather scarce in Avonlea. But apologize to Mrs. Lynde you must and shall and you'll stay here in your room until you can tell me you're willing to do it. I shall have to stay here forever then, said and mournfully, because I can't tell Mrs. Lynde I'm sorry I said those things to her. How can I? I'm not sorry. I'm sorry I've vexed you, but I'm glad I told her just what I did. It was a great satisfaction. I can't say I'm sorry when I'm not, can I? I can't even imagine I'm sorry. Perhaps your imagination will be in better working order by the morning, said Marilla, rising to depart. You'll have the night to think over your conduct in and come to a better frame of mind. You said you would try to be a very good girl if we kept you at Green Gables, but I must say it hasn't seemed very much like it this evening. Leaving this Parthian shaft to rankle in Anne's stormy bosom, Marilla descended to the kitchen, grievously troubled in mind and vexed in soul. She was as angry with herself as with Anne, because, whenever she recalled Mrs. Rachel's dumbfounded countenance her lips twitched with amusement and she felt a most reprehensible desire to laugh. Dash. Chapter 10. Anne's Apology. Marilla said nothing to Matthew about the affair that evening, but when Anne proved still refractory the next morning an explanation had to be made to account for her absence from the breakfast table. Marilla told Matthew the whole story, taking pains to impress him with a due sense of the enormity of Anne's behavior. It's a good thing Rachel Lynde got a calling down, she's a meddlesome old gossip, was Matthew's consolatory rejoinder. Matthew Cuthbert, I'm astonished at you. You know that Anne's behavior was dreadful, and yet you take her part. I suppose you'll be saying next thing that she oughtn't to be punished at all. Well now, no, not exactly, said Matthew uneasily. I reckon she ought to be punished a little. But don't be too hard on her, Marilla. Recollect she hasn't ever had anyone to teach her right. You're, you're going to give her something to eat? aren't you? When did you ever hear of me starving people into good behavior? demanded Marilla indignantly. She'll have her meals regular, and I'll carry them up to her myself. But she'll stay up there until she's willing to apologize to Mrs. Lynde, and that's final, Matthew. Breakfast, dinner, and supper were very silent meals, for Anne still remained obdurate. After each meal Marilla carried a well-filled tray to the East Gable and brought it down later on not noticeably depleted. Matthew at its last descent with a troubled eye. Hadn't eaten anything at all? When Marilla went out that evening to bring the cows from the back pasture, Matthew, who had been hanging about the barns and watching, slipped into the house with the air of a burglar and crept upstairs. As a general thing Matthew gravitated between the kitchen and the little bedroom off the hall where he slept, once in a while he ventured uncomfortably into the parlor or sitting room when the minister came to tea. But he had never been upstairs in his own house since the spring he helped Marilla paper the spare bedroom, and that was four years ago. He tiptoed along the hall and stood for several minutes outside the door of the east gable before he summoned courage to tap on it with his fingers and then open the door to peep in. Anne was sitting on the yellow chair by the window gazing mournfully out into the garden. Very small and unhappy she looked, and Matthew's heart smote him. He softly closed the door and tiptoed over to her. Anne, he whispered, as if afraid of being overheard, how are you making it, Anne? And smiled wanly. Pretty well. I imagine a good deal, and that helps to pass the time. Of course, it's rather lonesome. But then, I may as well get used to that. And smiled again, bravely facing the long years of solitary imprisonment before her. Matthew recollected that he must say what he had come to say without loss of time, lest Marilla return prematurely. Well now, Anne, don't you think you'd better do it and have it over with? He whispered. It'll have to be done sooner or later, you know, for Marilla's a dreadful determined woman, dreadful determined, Anne do it right off, I say, and have it over. Do you mean apologize to Mrs. Lynde? Yes, apologize, that's the very word, said Matthew eagerly. Just smooth it over so to speak. That's what I was trying to get at. I suppose I could do it to oblige you, said and thoughtfully. It would be true enough to say I am sorry, because I am sorry now. I wasn't a bit sorry last night. 
I was mad clear through and I stayed mad all night. I know I did because I woke up three times and I was just furious every time. But this morning it was over. I wasn't in a temper anymore, and it left a dreadful sort of goneness, too. I felt so ashamed of myself. But I just couldn't think of going and telling Mrs. Lynn so. It would be so humiliating. I made up my mind I'd stay shut up here forever rather than do that. But still, I'd do anything for you, if you really want me to. Well now, of course I do. It's terrible lonesome downstairs without you. Just go and smooth things over, that's a good girl. Very well, said and resignedly. I'll tell Marilla as soon as she comes and I've repented. That's right, that's right, Anne. But don't tell Marilla I said anything about it. She might think I was putting my or Anne and I promise not to do that. Wild horses won't drag the secret from me, promised and solemnly. How would wild horses drag a secret from a person anyhow? But Matthew was gone, scared at his own success. He fled hastily to the remotest corner of the horse pasture lest Marilla should suspect what he had been up to. Marilla herself, upon her return to the house, was agreeably surprised to hear a plaintive voice calling, Marilla over the banisters. Well, she said, going into the hall. I'm sorry I lost my temper and said rude things, and I'm willing to go and tell Mrs. Lynn so. Very well. Marilla's crispness gave no sign of her relief. She had been wondering what under the canopy she should do if Anne did not give in. I'll take you down after milking. Accordingly, after milking, behold Marilla and Anne walking down the lane, the former erect and triumphant, the latter drooping and dejected. But halfway down Anne's dejection vanished as if by enchantment. She lifted her head and stepped lightly along, her eyes fixed on the sunset sky and an air of subdued exhilaration about her. Marilla beheld the change disapprovingly. This was no meek penitent such as it behooved her to take into the presence of the offended Mrs. Lynde. What are you thinking of, Anne? She asked sharply. I'm imagining out what I must say to Mrs. Lynde, answered Anne dreamily. This was satisfactory, or should have been so. But Marilla could not rid herself of the notion that something in her scheme of punishment was going ask you. And had no business to look so rapt and radiant. Rapt and radiant and continued until they were in the very presence of Mrs. Lynde, who was sitting knitting by her kitchen window. Then the radiance vanished. Mournful penitence appeared on every feature. Before a word was spoken and suddenly went down on her knees before the astonished Mrs. Rachel and held out her hands beseechingly. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, I am so extremely sorry, she said with a quiver in her voice. I could never express all my sorrow, no, not if I used up a whole dictionary. You must just imagine it. I behaved terribly to you, and I've disgraced the dear friends, Matthew and Marilla, who have let me stay at Green Gables although I'm not a boy. I'm a dreadfully wicked and ungrateful girl, and I deserve to be punished and cast out by respectable people forever. It was very wicked of me to fly into a temper because you told me the truth. It was the truth, every word you said was true. My hair is red and I'm freckled and skinny and ugly. What I said to you was true, too, but I shouldn't have said it. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, please, please, forgive me. If you refuse it will be a lifelong sorrow on a poor little orphan girl, would you, even if she had a dreadful temper? Oh, I am sure you wouldn't. Please say you forgive me, Mrs. Lynde. And clasped her hands together, bowed her head, and waited for the word of judgment. There was no mistaking her sincerity, it breathed in every tone of her voice. Both Marilla and Mrs. Lynde recognized its unmistakable ring. But the former understood in dismay that Anne was actually enjoying her valley of humiliation, was reveling in the thoroughness of her abasement. Where was the wholesome punishment upon which she, Marilla, had plumed herself? And had turned it into a species of positive pleasure. Good Mrs. Lynde, not being overburdened with perception, did not see this. She only perceived that Anne had made a very thorough apology and all resentment vanished from her kindly, if somewhat officious, heart. There, there, get up, child, she said heartily. Of course I forgive you. I guess I was a little too hard on you, anyway. But I'm such an outspoken person. You just mustn't mind me, that's what. It can't be denied your hair is terrible red, but I knew a girl once, went to school with her, in fact, whose hair was every mite as red as yours when she was young, but when she grew up it darkened to a real handsome auburn. I wouldn't be a mite surprised if yours did, too, run a mite. Oh, Mrs. Lynde. And drew a long breath as she rose to her feet. You have given me a hope. I shall always feel that you are a benefactor. Oh, I could endure anything if I only thought my hair would be a handsome auburn when I grew up. It would be so much easier to be good if one's hair was a handsome auburn, don't you think? And now may I go out into your garden and sit on that bench under the apple trees while you and Marilla are talking? 
there is so much more scope for imagination out there. Laws, yes, run along, child. And you can pick a bouquet of them white June lilies over in the corner if you like. As the door closed behind and Mrs. Lynde got briskly up to light a lamp. She's a real odd little thing. Take this chair, Marilla, it's easier than the one you've got, I just keep that for the hired boy to sit on. Yes, she certainly is an odd child, but there is something kind of taking about her after all. I don't feel so surprised at you and Matthew keeping her as I did, nor so sorry for you, either. She may turn out all right. Of course, she has a queer way of expressing herself, a little too, well, too kind of forcible, you know, but she'll likely get over that now that she's come to live among civilized folks. And then, her temper's pretty quick, I guess, but there's one comfort, a child that has a quick temper, just blaze up and cool down, ain't never likely to be sly or deceitful. Preserve me from a sly child, that's what. On the whole, Marilla, I kind of like her. When Marilla went home and came out of the fragrant twilight of the orchard with a sheaf of white narcissi in her hands. I apologized pretty well, didn't I? She said proudly as they went down the lane. I thought since I had to do it I might as well do it thoroughly. You did it thoroughly, all right enough, was Marilla's comment. Marilla was dismayed at finding herself inclined to laugh over the recollection. She had also an uneasy feeling that she ought to scold Anne for apologizing so well but then, that was ridiculous. She compromised with her conscience by saying severely. I hope you won't have occasion to make many more such apologies. I hope you'll try to control your temper now, Anne. That wouldn't be so hard if people wouldn't twit me about my looks, said Anne with a sigh. I don't get cross about other things, but I'm so tired of being twitted about my hair and it just makes me boil right over. Do you suppose my hair will really be a handsome auburn when I grow up? You shouldn't think so much about your looks, Anne. I'm afraid you are a very vain little girl. How could I be vain when I know I'm homely? Protested Anne. I love pretty things, and I hate to look in the glass and see something that isn't pretty. It makes me feel so sorrowful, just as I feel when I look at any ugly thing. I pity it because it isn't beautiful. Handsome is as handsome does, quoted Marilla. I've had that said to me before, but I have my doubts about it, remarked skeptical Anne, sniffing at her narcissi. Oh, aren't these flowers sweet? It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give them to me. I have no hard feelings against Mrs. Lynde now. It gives you a lovely, comfortable feeling to apologize and be forgiven, doesn't it? Aren't the stars bright tonight? If you could live in a star, which one would you pick? I'd like that lovely clear big one away over there above that dark hill. And, do hold your tongue, said Marilla, thoroughly worn out trying to follow the gyrations of Anne's thoughts. And said no more until they turned into their own lane. A little gypsy wind came down to meet them, laden with the spicy perfume of young dew-wet ferns. Far up in the shadows a cheerful light gleamed out through the trees from the kitchen at Green Gables. And suddenly came close to Marilla and slipped her hand into the older woman's hard palm. It's lovely to be going home and know it's home, she said. I love Green Gables already, and I never loved any place before. No place ever seemed like home. Oh Marilla, I'm so happy. I could pray right now and not find it a bit hard. Something warm and pleasant welled up in Marilla's heart at touch of that thin little hand in her own, a throb of the maternity she had missed, perhaps. Its very unaccustomedness and sweetness disturbed her. She hastened to restore her sensations to their normal calm by inculcating a moral. If you'll be a good girl you'll always be happy, Anne. And you should never find it hard to say your prayers. Saying one's prayers isn't exactly the same thing as praying, said in meditatively but I'm going to imagine that I'm the wind that is blowing up there in those treetops. When I get tired of the trees I'll imagine I'm gently waving down here in the ferns, and then I'll fly over to Mrs. Lynde's garden and set the flowers dancing, and then I'll go with one great swoop over the clover field, and then I'll blow over the lake of shining waters and ripple it all up into little sparkling waves. Oh, there's so much scope for imagination in a wind. So I'll not talk any more just now, Marilla. Thanks be to goodness for that, breathed Marilla in devout relief. Dash. Chapter 11. Anne's Impressions of Sunday School. Well, how do you like them? said Marilla. Anne was standing in the gable room, looking solemnly at three new dresses spread out on the bed. One was of snuffy colored gingham which Marilla had been tempted to buy from a peddler the preceding summer because it looked so serviceable, one was of black and white checkered sateen which she had picked up at a bargain counter in the winter, and one was a stiff print of an ugly blue shade which she had purchased that week at a Carmody store. She had made them up herself, and they were all made alike, plain skirts fold tightly to plain waists, with sleeves as plain as waist and skirt and tight as sleeves could be. 
I'll imagine that I like them, said in soberly. I don't want you to imagine it, said Marilla, offended. Oh, I can see you don't like the dresses. What is the matter with them? Aren't they neat and clean and new? Yes. Then why don't you like them? They're, they're not, pretty, said Anne reluctantly. Pretty. Marilla sniffed. I didn't trouble my head about getting pretty dresses for you. I don't believe in pampering vanity, Anne, I'll tell you that right off. Those dresses are good, sensible, serviceable dresses, without any frills or furbelows about them, and they're all you'll get this summer. The brown gingham and the blue print will do you for school when you begin to go. The sateen is for church and Sunday school. I'll expect you to keep them neat and clean and not to tear them. I should think you'd be grateful to get most anything after those skimpy wincy things you've been wearing. Oh, I am grateful, protested Anne. But I'd be ever so much gratefuler if, if you'd made just one of them with puffed sleeves. Puffed sleeves are so fashionable now. It would give me such a thrill, Marilla, just to wear a dress with puffed sleeves. Well, you'll have to do without your thrill. I hadn't any material to waste on puffed sleeves. I think they are ridiculous looking things anyhow. I prefer the plain, sensible ones. But I'd rather look ridiculous when everybody else does than plain and sensible all by myself, persisted and mournfully. Trust you for that. Well, hang those dresses carefully up in your closet, and then sit down and learn the Sunday school lesson. I got a quarterly from Mr. Bell for you and you'll go to Sunday school tomorrow, said Marilla, disappearing downstairs in high dudgeon. Anne clasped her hands and looked at the dresses. I did hope there would be a white one with puffed sleeves, she whispered disconsolately. I prayed for one, but I didn't much expect it on that account. I didn't suppose God would have time to bother about a little orphan girl's dress. I knew I'd just have to depend on Marilla for it. Well, fortunately I can imagine that one of them is of snow-white muslin with lovely lace frills and three puffed sleeves. The next morning warnings of a sick headache prevented Marilla from going to Sunday school with Anne. You'll have to go down and call for Mrs. Lynde, Anne, she said. She'll see that you get into the right class. Now, mind you behave yourself properly. Stay to preaching afterwards and ask Mrs. Lynde to show you our pew. Here's a cent for collection. Don't stare at people and don't fidget. I shall expect you to tell me the text when you come home. And started off irreproachable, arrayed in the stiff black and white sateen, which, while decent as regards length and certainly not open to the charge of skimpiness, contrived to emphasize every corner and angle of her thin figure. Her hat was a little, flat, glossy, new sailor, the extreme plainness of which had likewise much disappointed Anne, who had permitted herself secret visions of ribbon and flowers. The latter, however, were supplied before and reached the main road, for being confronted halfway down the lane with a golden frenzy of wind-stirred buttercups and a glory of wild roses, and promptly and liberally garlanded her hat with a heavy wreath of them. Whatever other people might have thought of the result it satisfied Anne, and she tripped gaily down the road, holding her ruddy head with its decoration of pink and yellow very proudly. When she had reached Mrs. Lynde's house she found that lady gone. Nothing daunted, and proceeded onward to the church alone. In the porch she found a crowd of little girls, all more or less gaily attired in whites and blues and pinks, and all staring with curious eyes at this stranger in their midst, with her extraordinary head adornment. Avonlea little girls had already heard queer stories about Anne. Mrs. Lynde said she had an awful temper, Jerry Biot, the hired boy at Green Gables, said she talked all the time to herself or to the trees and flowers like a crazy girl. They looked at her and whispered to each other behind their quarterlies. Nobody made any friendly advances, then or later on when the opening exercises were over and Anne found herself in Miss Rogerson's class. Miss Rogerson was a middle-aged lady who had taught a Sunday school class for twenty years. Her method of teaching was to ask the printed questions from the quarterly and look sternly over its edge at the particular little girl she thought ought to answer the question. She looked very often at Anne, and Anne, thanks to Marilla's drilling, answered promptly, but it may be questioned if she understood very much about either question or answer. She did not think she liked Miss Rogerson, and she felt very miserable, every other little girl in the class had puffed sleeves. And felt that life was really not worth living without puffed sleeves. Well, how did you like Sunday school? Marilla wanted to know when Anne came home. Her wreath having faded, and had discarded it in the lane, so Marilla was spared the knowledge of that for a time. I didn't like it a bit. It was horrid. And surely, said Marilla rebukingly. And sat down on the rocker with a long sigh, kissed one of Bonnie's leaves, and waved her hand to a blossoming fuchsia. They might have been lonesome while I was away, she explained. And now about the Sunday school. I behaved well, just as you told me. Mrs. Lynde was gone, but I went right on myself. 
I went into the church, with a lot of other little girls, and I sat in the corner of a pew by the window while the opening exercises went on. Mr. Bell made an awfully long prayer. I would have been dreadfully tired before he got through if I hadn't been sitting by that window. But it looked right out on the lake of shining waters, so I just gazed at that and imagined all sorts of splendid things. You shouldn't have done anything of the sort. You should have listened to Mr. Bell. But he wasn't talking to me, protested Anne. He was talking to God and he didn't seem to be very much interested in it, either. I think he thought God was too far off though. There was a long row of white birches hanging over the lake and the sunshine fell down through them way, way down, deep into the water. Oh Marilla, it was like a beautiful dream. It gave me a thrill and I just said, thank you for it, God, two or three times. Not out loud, I hope, said Marilla anxiously. Oh, no, just under my breath. Well, Mr. Bell did get through at last and they told me to go into the classroom with Miss Rogerson's class. There were nine other girls in it. They all had puff sleeves. I tried to imagine mine were puffed, too, but I couldn't. Why couldn't I? It was as easy as could be to imagine they were puffed when I was alone in the East Gable, but it was awfully hard there among the others who had really truly puffs. You shouldn't have been thinking about your sleeves in Sunday school. You should have been attending to the lesson. I hope you knew it. Oh, yes, and I answered a lot of questions. Miss Rogerson asked ever so many. I don't think it was fair for her to do all the asking. There were lots I wanted to ask her, but I didn't like to because I didn't think she was a kindred spirit. Then all the other little girls recited a paraphrase. She asked me if I knew any. I told her I didn't, but I could recite, the dog at his master's grave if she liked. That's in the third royal reader. It isn't a really truly religious piece of poetry, but it's so sad and melancholy that it might as well be. She said it wouldn't do and she told me to learn the 19th paraphrase for next Sunday. I read it over in church afterwards and it's splendid. There are two lines in particular that just thrill me. Quick as the slaughtered squadrons fell in Midian's evil day. I don't know what squadrons means nor Midian, either, but it sounds so tragical. I can hardly wait until next Sunday to recite it. I'll practice it all the week. After Sunday school I asked Miss Rogerson, because Mrs. Lynde was too far away, to show me your pew. I sat just as still as I could and the text was Revelations, third chapter, second and third verses. It was a very long text. If I was a minister I'd pick the short, snappy ones. The sermon was awfully long, too. I suppose the minister had to match it to the text. I didn't think he was a bit interesting. The trouble with him seems to be that he hasn't enough imagination. I didn't listen to him very much. I just let my thoughts run and I thought of the most surprising things. Marilla felt helplessly that all this should be sternly reproved, but she was hampered by the undeniable fact that some of the things Anne had said, especially about the minister's sermons and Mr. Bell's prayers, were what she herself had really thought deep down in her heart for years, but had never given expression to. It almost seemed to her that those secret, unuttered, critical thoughts had suddenly taken visible and accusing shape and form in the person of this outspoken morsel of neglected humanity. Dash. Chapter 12. A Solemn Vow and Promise. It was not until the next Friday that Marilla heard the story of the flower-wreathed hat. She came home from Mrs. Lynn's and called Anne to account. And, Mrs. Rachel says you went to church last Sunday with your hat rigged out ridiculous with roses and buttercups. What on earth put you up to such a caper? A pretty looking object you must have been. Oh. I know pink and yellow aren't becoming to me, began Anne. Becoming fiddlesticks. It was putting flowers on your hat at all, no matter what color they were, that was ridiculous. You are the most aggravating child. I don't see why it's any more ridiculous to wear flowers on your hat than on your dress, protested Anne. Lots of little girls there had bouquets pinned on their dresses. What's the difference? Marilla was not to be drawn from the safe concrete into dubious paths of the abstract. Don't answer me back like that, Anne. It was very silly of you to do such a thing. Never let me catch you at such a trick again. Mrs. Rachel says she thought she would sink through the floor when she saw you come in all rigged out like that. She couldn't get near enough to tell you to take them off till it was too late. She says people talked about it something dreadful. Of course they would think I had no better sense than to let you go decked out like that. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Anne, tears welling into her eyes. I never thought you'd mind. The roses and buttercups were so sweet and pretty I thought they'd look lovely on my hat. Lots of the little girls had artificial flowers on their hats. I'm afraid I'm going to be a dreadful trial to you. Maybe you'd better send me back to the asylum. That would be terrible, I don't think I could endure it, most likely I would go into consumption, I'm so thin as it is, you see but that would be better than being a trial to you. 
Nonsense, said Marilla, vexed at herself for having made the child cry. I don't want to send you back to the asylum, I'm sure. All I want is that you should behave like other little girls and not make yourself ridiculous. Don't cry anymore. I've got some news for you. Diana Barry came home this afternoon. I'm going up to see if I can borrow a skirt pattern from Mrs. Barry, and if you like you can come with me and get acquainted with Diana. Anne rose to her feet, with clasped hands, the tears still glistening on her cheeks, the dish towel she had been hemming slipped unheeded to the floor. Oh Arilla, I'm frightened, now that it has come I'm actually frightened. What if she shouldn't like me? It would be the most tragical disappointment of my life. Now, don't get into a fluster. And I do wish you wouldn't use such long words. It sounds so funny in a little girl. I guess Diana'll like you well enough. It's her mother you've got to reckon with. If she doesn't like you it won't matter how much Diana does. If she has heard about your outburst to Mrs. Lynde and going to church with buttercups round your hat I don't know what she'll think of you. You must be polite and well-behaved, and don't make any of your startling speeches. For pity's sake, if the child isn't actually trembling. And was trembling. Her face was pale and tense. Oh, Marilla, you'd be excited, too, if you were going to meet a little girl you hope to be your bosom friend and whose mother mightn't like you, she said as she hastened to get her hat. They went over to Orchard Slope by the short cut across the brook and up the furry hill grove. Mrs. Barry came to the kitchen door in answer to Marilla's knock. She was a tall black-eyed, black-haired woman, with a very resolute mouth. She had the reputation of being very strict with her children. How do you do, Marilla? She said cordially. Come in. And this is the little girl you have adopted, I suppose? Yes, this is Anne Shirley, said Marilla. Spelled with an E, gasped Anne who, tremulous and excited as she was, was determined there should be no misunderstanding on that important point. Mrs. Barry, not hearing or not comprehending, merely shook hands and said kindly. How are you? I am well in body although considerable rumpled up in spirit, thank you ma'am, said in gravely. Then aside to Marilla in an audible whisper, there wasn't anything startling in that, was there, Marilla? Diana was sitting on the sofa, reading a book which she dropped when the callers entered. She was a very pretty little girl, with her mother's black eyes and hair, and rosy cheeks, and the merry expression which was her inheritance from her father. This is my little girl Diana, said Mrs. Barry. Diana, you might take it out into the garden and show her your flowers. It will be better for you than straining your eyes over that book. She reads entirely too much, this to Marilla as the little girls went out and I can't prevent her, for her father aids and abets her. She's always poring over a book. I'm glad she has the prospect of a playmate, perhaps it will take her more out of doors. Outside in the garden, which was full of mellow sunset light streaming through the dark old firs to the west of it, stood Anne and Diana, gazing bashfully at each other over a clump of gorgeous tiger lilies. The berry garden was a bowery wilderness of flowers which would have delighted Anne's heart at any time less fraught with destiny. It was encircled by huge old willows and tall firs, beneath which flourished flowers that loved the shade. Prim, right-angled paths neatly bordered with clamshells, intersected it like moist red ribbons, and in the beds between old-fashioned flowers ran riot. There were rosy bleeding hearts and great splendid crimson peonies, white, fragrant narcissi and thorny, sweet scotch roses, pink and blue and white columbines and lilac-tinted bouncing bets, clumps of southern wood and ribbon grass and mint, purple adam and eve, daffodils, and masses of sweet clover white with its delicate, fragrant, feathery sprays, scarlet lightning that shot its fiery lances over prim white musk flowers a garden it was where sunshine lingered and bees hummed, and winds, beguiled into loitering, purred and rustled. Oh Anna, said Anne at last, clasping her hands and speaking almost in a whisper, oh, do you think you can like me a little, enough to be my bosom friend? Diana laughed. Diana always laughed before she spoke. Why, I guess so, she said frankly. I'm awfully glad you've come to live at Green Gables. It will be jolly to have somebody to play with. There isn't any other girl who lives near enough to play with, and I've no sisters big enough. Will you swear to be my friend forever and ever? demanded Anne eagerly. Diana looked shocked. Why it's dreadfully wicked to swear, she said rebukingly. Oh no, not my kind of swearing. There are two kinds, you know. I never heard of the one kind, said Diana doubtfully. There really is another. Oh, it isn't wicked at all. It just means vowing and promising solemnly. Well, I don't mind doing that, agreed Diana, relieved. How do you do it? We must join hands, so, said in gravely. It ought to be over running water. We'll just imagine this path is running water. I'll repeat the oath first. 
I solemnly swear to be faithful to my bosom friend, Diana Barry, as long as the sun and moon shall endure. Now you say it and put my name in. Diana repeated the oath with a laugh fore and aft. Then she said. You're a queer girl, Anne? I heard before that you were queer. But I believe I'm going to like you real well. When Marilla and Anne went home Diana went with them as far as the log bridge. The two little girls walked with their arms about each other. At the brook they parted with many promises to spend the next afternoon together. Well, did you find Diana a kindred spirit? Asked Marilla as they went up through the Garden of Green Gables. Oh yes, sighed Anne, blissfully unconscious of any sarcasm on Marilla's part. Oh Marilla, I'm the happiest girl on Prince Edward Island this very moment. I assure you I'll say my prayers with a right goodwill tonight. Diana and I are going to build a playhouse in Mr. William Bell's Birch Grove tomorrow. Can I have those broken pieces of china that are out in the woodshed? Diana's birthday is in February and mine is in March. Don't you think that is a very strange coincidence? Diana is going to lend me a book to read. She says it's perfectly splendid and tremendously exciting. She's going to show me a place back in the woods where rice lilies grow. Don't you think Diana has got very soulful eyes? I wish I had soulful eyes. Diana is going to teach me to sing a song called Nellie in the Hazel Dell. She's going to give me a picture to put up in my room. It's a perfectly beautiful picture, she says, a lovely lady in a pale blue silk dress. A sewing machine agent gave it to her. I wish I had something to give Diana. I'm an inch taller than Diana, but she is ever so much fatter. She says she'd like to be thin because it's so much more graceful, but I'm afraid she only said it to soothe my feelings. We're going to the shore some day to gather shells. We have agreed to call the spring down by the log bridge the Dryad's Bubble. Isn't that a perfectly elegant name? I read a story once about a spring called that. A dryad is sort of a grown-up fairy, I think. Well, all I hope is you won't talk Diana to death, said Marilla. But remember this in all your planning, Anne. You're not going to play all the time nor most of it. You'll have your work to do and it'll have to be done first. Anne's cup of happiness was full, and Matthew caused it to overflow. He had just got home from a trip to the store at Carmody, and he sheepishly produced a small parcel from his pocket and handed it to Anne, with a deprecatory look at Marilla. I heard you say you like chocolate sweeties, so I got you some, he said. Humphrey, sniffed Marilla. It'll ruin her teeth and stomach. There, there, child, don't look so dismal. You can eat those, since Matthew has gone and got them. He'd better have brought you peppermints. They're wholesomer. Don't sicken yourself eating all them at once now. Oh, indeed, I won't, said Anne eagerly. I'll just eat one tonight, Marilla. And I can give Diana half of them, can't I? The other half will taste twice as sweet to me if I give some to her. It's delightful to think I have something to give her. I will say it for the child, said Marilla when Anne had gone to her gable, she isn't stingy. I'm glad, for of all faults I detest stinginess in a child. Dear me, it's only three weeks since she came, and it seems as if she'd been here always. I can't imagine the place without her. Now, don't be looking I told you so, Matthew. That's bad enough in a woman, but it isn't to be endured in a man. I'm perfectly willing to own up that I'm glad I consented to keep the child and that I'm getting fond of her, but don't you rub it in, Matthew Cuthbert. 